Hey everyone, here we are. We're in Boys Town, New Brunswick, near the Central New Brunswick Woodsman Museum. Behind me on this pad normally sits a TBM-3 Grauman Avenger, but unfortunately they don't have it here right now. Uh, it's actually been put away for storage. But fortunately, I was able to talk to the caretaker and he's gonna allow us to have special access and be able to view it. So come on, let's go. So behind me, this is the Grumman TBM-3 Avenger that they have uh, normally out there on display, but now because it's winter time, they have it here in storage. Uh, fortunately, we can also see that the wings are in the stove position. So this is how it would have looked on a US aircraft carrier during the war. So now we're gonna go inside and take a look. So using this hatch, this is where the turret gunner and the radio man slash bombardier would have entered the aircraft. There was no direct access between this space and where the pilot sat up here. So that's where the pilot would have to climb the wing and then enter the cockpit that way. In behind him, it looks like it could be another seat. It's actually where the radio equipment is. And it was so large, it took up all that space. Up here used to be a turret, but they had replaced it due to it not being needed anymore, obviously. This here, this is called the ventral gun position. Let me see if I can get some more light in here for us real quick. So this position here is a ventral gun position and this is where the bombardier slash uh, radio man would actually be able from this position because he had all of his bombing equipment and stuff was here. He could turn around if they were being fired at from below, he would look through here with his machine gun and fire at the enemy. Whereas up here, this is where that ball turret used to be. You can still see the turret ring. Here, so not much space, not much space in here at all. Like you can see how large I am and yeah, there's, yeah, not much space at all in here. Uh, that right there, that little doorway, the silver bit of metal, uh, that is basically a little hallway that goes up to the battery room. And in case of the plane being ditched in the ocean, uh, you wouldn't be able to use this door. It would be in the water. So the turret gunner and the radio man would have to climb through that little space probably very quickly, as fast as they could, and get out through where the radio equipment was housed. So there's a little bit of space there. They can open up the canopy just like the uh, pilot would be able to. And then they would get out together. This is the plate that they usually have displayed out there saying this historic Avenger aircraft, Tanker 41, is dedicated to those who flew, maintained, and serviced them over the period of 46 years, during which time they served the New Brunswick forestry industry in both forest inspect or forest insect spraying and forest fire protection. This aircraft served the American military for 16 years and forest service in both the USA and New Brunswick for 46 years. This shows the experience and quality of the manufacturer and the durability of the aircraft. And I would tend to agree. These are really well built. Machine grade or airplane grade aluminum. So again, this position here, just to get the visual, hopefully you can see well. So this position here, there would be a seat. This is where, sorry, the seat, this, <laughs> this is where the radio man would sit. And he would uh, also, as a bombardier, look through a window, which I believe would have been right here. He'd look through this window and have to brace himself against these as they were diving. You can just imagine a pitch like this. You would hang on to this frame of the aircraft, sight in your target, and drop the bombs. And you could look through this little hole between your legs, and that's how you drop bombs. So the pilot would only get them in position. This man would actually drop the bombs. At the same time, you have this ball turret, ball turret gunner up in this position. This here was designed for a man roughly the height of five foot eight. Uh, any taller than that, it was too much of a tight squeeze. Uh, 
So he would be facing this direction, backwards. So as you're diving, he has no idea how close the ground is, anything. And he's just looking for enemy fighters, anything coming in trying to attack the aircraft. Another cool thing that the bombardier slash radio man would do is as he neared the target, he would get a call from the captain saying, okay, we're getting close. And he would use these metal strips called shaft or chafe and he would get this door open and he could only get it open maybe two inches and he would just release this out and that would screw up the uh, enemy's radar and their uh, AA guns would hopefully not be able to lock on target and uh, attack the uh, airplane. Here's some of the original markings. This is great. I can't believe that we gained access into the aircraft itself. This is amazing. But yeah, you can see. Oh. Yeah, so this here would have been an opening which you could go through into this area. Which is where all the radio equipment was stored. Great. Amazing. This ball tour, turret, it was electrically, uh, so it was moved electrically. And what they would do is the gunner would have basically a controller or like a remote control. And as he turned, uh, as he turned to the left with the controller or right with the controller, this whole turret ring would spin. And it had safety so that you wouldn't shoot the tail off because if you could see out through here, that's the tail's right there. So you'd have these stops that would keep you from blowing your aircraft apart. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is, yeah, this is a joy being in here. Amazing. Couldn't believe, I would never believe that I've been inside one of these aircraft. Amazing. So yeah, you can imagine, here's the radio man. Oh no, bogey behind. He can look out through these windows to see him. He has to get into this crouching position, grabbing the machine gun, and shoot the target. So you can see here, this now they've put sheet metal, but the original canvas must have rotted away. Now they have a trailer hitch, but originally there would have been like a rod out here that would catch as this plane would land on an aircraft carrier they would land and that would catch the cable to stop them before they went off the edge of the uh, aircraft carrier, basically. This here, as you remember from the other crash site that we were just at, this is what the tire, the rear tire would have looked like in the rear landing gear assembly. There you can see where they stow the wheel. The wheels would lift up in flight. They would stow these. So up here, there we go. That's the uh, pilot just hanging out. We can see here there's no instruments. The instruments have been all removed. There's some of the gauges that are left, throttles. But you can see, so this canopy would come back and then here, this is where the batteries were held and this is where those men would have to climb through and get out through this. And again, you'd have a ball turret here, which no longer is there. There you go, that's uh, for fuel. There we are, those are the propellers. I believe the propeller length, it would have been 13 feet from tip to tip. And again, this engine could pump out 1900 horsepower because this aircraft is actually the heaviest single engine aircraft used during the Second World War. It also was the most efficient or the most effective torpedo bomber and dive bomber of the Second World War. So as you walk along here, they have a sticky or a, they have some paint here, anti-slip, so you don't slip right off. As we walk along, I wanna show you how this stow wing lock mechanism would have operated and worked. So here we are, that's the landing gear. Up here, this is a pin. So it would come down and it would latch to here. And all this, this whole mechanism, 
pivots off this one point right here. That's where it pivots off. So as this comes down, they're actually, you can see right there, there used to be a flag that would have come up this and sticks through this hole. And that would allow the pilot to know that the wing was actually locked. But I see here for some reason they have it removed. So this is a hydraulic piston. So when this, this section here swings like this up in position, that goes into there. It's got a pinhole. The hydraulic piston would go through locking the wing in place. And then this flag, which would have been a red tab, would have come down into position, letting the pilot know that the wing is actually locked and you can actually take off. You don't want to take off if your wing's not uh, attached. But yeah, I'm pretty sure these are Hamilton uh, uh, propeller blades. This here, that's the air intake for the engine. So with these aircraft, the original uh, designer was Grumman and they built the first 2,000, a little over 2,000 of these aircraft and they are called the TBF variant. After that, uh, they got put on to other jobs. Mainly, I think they were producing airplane parts for the uh, Hellcat. So then the contract went to General Motors and they're from, uh, well, the plant was in Ewing Township, New Jersey, and they produced the following 7,000, which we now know are the TBM variant of uh, the Avenger. So with these aircraft, they first saw combat at the Battle of Midway. And there was only six aircraft that were available at the time for the battle. And out of those six, only one aircraft actually survived not being shot down. Uh, also, during that same battle, the flagship for the Japanese Navy, the Yamato, also made its debut. Even though it didn't really take part in the battle, um, it was there and it was the largest battleship and it was the most powerful battleship ever built. It and its sister ship, the Musashi. With both of these uh, battleships, later on in the war, both of them would be destroyed by dive bombers and torpedo planes um, in different battles, of course. With the Yamata, um, it was sent out on a one-way mission and it was near the end of the war. The Americans were landing on Okinawa and they ordered it to go to Okinawa. You're going to beach the battleship. You're then going to fight until destroyed. Unfortunately for the Yamato, uh, they didn't make it. And what happened was they were spotted. Uh, dive bombers came in and they sunk it. So the largest battleship ever created uh, was sunk by torpedo planes like the Avenger. Also, the Yamato, that was the pride of the Japanese Navy because Yamato means Japan in the ancient language of uh, Japan. Also, the Musashi is named after uh, a famous samurai, if you're, in case you're wondering. Here, this is the Bombay doors. So, using this, these doors would be open. They could carry... Uh, a 2,000 pound Mark 13 uh, torpedo, or they could carry up to four 500 pound uh, bombs. Uh, also, they could uh, they use these for laying mines as well. So they could store it up here, and when they were doing the fire bombing, or I mean, when they're doing the water bombing and uh, spraying, they could get a little more than 600 US gallons of uh, liquid inside here. So I think it was 625 US gallons. Pretty impressive. Amazing. The most famous Avenger pilot of the Second World War was future President of the United States, George Bush Sr., who when he was 18 years old after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he joined the US Navy 
and then within a year he became uh, he became a pilot and he was one of the youngest aviators I think he was the youngest aviator at the time that he was given his wings uh, his first battle was at the uh, Battle of Wake Island which had been taken over by the Japanese at that time uh, Later on, he was shot down when they were attacking the island of Chichijima. So Chichijima is just northeast of Iwo Jima. Uh, so George Bush goes in, he drops his four 500 pound bombs on his targets. They're attacking a radio installation and some other targets, I believe. Um, they, the, the aircraft caught on fire. He flew over top of the ocean and ordered the men to bail out. Unfortunately, he was able to bail out. His parachute worked. One of the other crew members of the three um, also bailed out, but his parachute did not open. So unfortunately, he passed away. He hit the water. Uh, the third man, whoever that was, he never got out of the aircraft at all. So luckily for George Bush, there were submarines. So normally when they would go in and do these dive bomb runs and torpedo runs, they would leave submarines around the island or around where they were attacking. And when a pilot was shot down, they then would uh, go and rescue downed pilots. So this was a common thing. So George Bush, he was rescued by um, one of these submarines, uh, the USS Finback, I believe. Out of all of the aviators that attacked that day, nine of them were shot down, at least nine, maybe 10. George Bush Sr. was the only one who was rescued. The other men, they were captured by the Japanese. They were first tortured. Uh, beaten and then they were all executed and then some of them they say uh, their livers were eaten by the Japanese that had captured them so they cannibalized some of these airmen so the history of these aircraft and why they're even here in New Brunswick is a really interesting story so after the war in night between 1950 and 1952 the Royal Canadian Navy purchased 125 Avengers from the US Navy and they were going to use them as anti-submarine uh, aircraft within a short time they phased them out and then they sold them to private industries throughout Canada and that's why we have the spruce budworm spraying and companies in British Columbia, Ontario, New Brunswick, all over the board. They would use these aircraft because they were so versatile. You could use them for firefighting with the, fire, with the uh, water bombing. You could use them as uh, bug sprayers. Um, just great and just shows how versatile these uh, aircraft were. Out of those 125 aircraft originally purchased by the Canadian Navy, there's believed to be only 12 remaining. So only 12 of these uh, TBM-3s exist in all of Canada. So that's a, sad, uh, that's a sad note, but it's great that they were able to be used this long. And I'm glad and I'm happy here that in Boys Town, New Brunswick, which is the central uh, point geographically of New Brunswick, they had one on display. So if you're driving between Fredericton and Miramichi, you'll see this on your way. Hard to miss. Unless it's the winter time, of course, because then they have it in storage. When the Can Royal Canadian Navy purchased 125 of these Avengers, uh, it was the most aircraft operated by the Royal Canadian Navy of any type of aircraft that they ever owned. So that's pretty interesting. Also, the Forest Protection Plan of uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, they also owned about 46 to 48 of these aircraft, making them the largest civilian owner operator of Avengers on Earth. So that's another thing for New Brunswick. We once had the most of these aircraft making them integral to the history of uh, our province. So that's a very interesting uh, point. Another thing too is the Amato, because it had the strongest uh, caliber guns and the largest guns of the Second World War, it was able to shoot um, a 3,200 pound projectile or a 3,200 pound armor piercing round about uh, 26 uh, miles, so 42 kilometers, which to give you an idea of how far that is, it is the distance of three and a half Confederation bridges or the distance between Moncton to the Nova Scotia border, St. John to Bloomfield or Fredericton to Nakawick. So one shell, 
that far. So if you've ever driven that, you know how far that actually is. I wanna thank uh, the operators of this museum for allowing us to gain this special access to be able to uh, share this story and talk about these aircraft. Thank you very much. See you in the next one. This here's the Woodsman Museum and they have some recreations of logging camps. I don't think those axes were there on uh, most camps as an ornament. So great place to check out. If you're in Boys Town, you should definitely come here, uh, pay this museum a visit, come see that Avenger.